The Gospel of Luke chapter 9. If you have a Bible with you, I invite you to open up your Bible. We encourage you to bring a Bible with you. I think it's something that as Christians we we want we want to be able to, to highlight and underline and take notes and just be able to remember some of the things the Lord would speak to us. Maybe you're visiting, you don't have a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. You're more than welcome to use one of the Bibles that are available for you there so that you can follow along as we're studying through the Word of God. We've been looking at the life of Jesus. We've been looking at uh, his, his ministry, finishing up the, re, the, the time that he had spent around the Sea of Galilee. That'd be the first three years of Jesus' ministry, for the most part, was spent in the, in the region of Galilee and around the Sea of Galilee. From this point forward, all the way to the crucifixion, Jesus doesn't make his way back there. He's now heading toward Jerusalem, and he's going to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. And he's aware that that's why he's going to Jerusalem. He, it was his mission. It was the reason that he had come, was so that he would pay the price for sin. Jesus is fully aware that the religious leaders are going to reject him, and then they're going to they're going to arrest him and then eventually have him crucified. He's been preparing the disciples for that very moment. You know, I think, you know, what, what, what a, 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 just, how, how do you function after spending three years with Jesus? And then, and then to Jesus to come and tell you, guess what, guys, I'm leaving you guys. Right? They have seen miracles. They've seen the power of God. They, they've seen um, you know, a love that they can't even comprehend up until this point. And now Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to depart. And so Jesus is wanting them, not, not for it to be something that you know, just happens, but something that he had been telling them over and over and over again. And if you remember back in chapter 9, um, in verse 44, he just did another miracle by casting out a demon out of a young boy who was being seized by this demon and, and thrown it into the fire, into the water, and he was having a seize, he was being seized at the very moment, and Jesus heals him, casts the demon out of him, and all the crowd that was there was amazed by it. And, and right, right at that moment, Jesus turns to his disciples there in verse 44 and well, actually, look at verse 43 and 44. It says, And they were all amazed at the majesty of God. And while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And he, he, want, he wanted them to, to you know, again, just look, guys, even though all these things are going on, even though all the miracles are taking place, you need to understand I'm on a mission here. And the mission that I'm on is the cross. And I'm going to the cross, and there's nothing going to you know, deter that or nothing's going to stop that, and I'm going to be betrayed by men. And it's, and it's shortly afterwards that we come to this passage this, this morning in verse 51, that Jesus is making his way to Jerusalem. No, this read verses 51 through 56, and then we'll come back and we'll expound upon that section of the passage. Watch what it says. And it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem and when his disciples James and John saw that that they saw this they said Lord do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them just as Elijah did I like James and John right <laughs> wow look at verse 55 and Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he said, do you not know what manner of spirit you're of? For the Son of Man did not come into, uh, did, he did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. 
51, we're reminded once again that, that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. And it's, it, it's a, the time had finally come. You know, they think that Jesus, for 33 years, for, for the first 30 years he had spent in Nazareth, uh, for, for the most part of his young, you know, uh, upbringing and, and up until the age of 30 years old, and then he begins his ministry. And then for the last three years, he had been uh, ministering to the disciples and to the villages around Galilee. And now the time had come, and, and he was making his way toward Jerusalem, knowing fully well that he was going to be crucified, beat, scorned, mocked, stabbed, speared, you, I mean, you know, with, with thorns on his head. He, he was fully aware of the scourging that would take place, and yet he's, he's determined that, that this, this, this was going to continue. And in order to get to Jerusalem from the northern country up in that region known as the Banyas, uh, that's where they, they had spent, you know, m much time as Jesus was with, with the apostles and the, the disciples that were following him. They had to cut through Samaria. Now, there was a rift between the Samaritans and the Jews. The rift was, was deep. It was, it was, it was wide. It, it, was, it was something that um, really affected, you know, everybody in the nation. There was a hatred for one another. What had happened was that, you see, the Assyrians had taken over the region of, uh, the Assyrians had taken over the region of Samaria. And they had intermingled with the Jews that were there. And because they had intermingled with them, the Jews saw them as second-class citizens. They were looked down upon by the Jews. And so they just kind of cut themselves off. They, they, they decided we're going to worship, worship at a, on, on a different place. We're, we're, we'll, we'll just kind of have our own religion. And the Jews always despised them. They, they, were, they were less than. The Samaritans, because they were rejected, well, if you don't want us, then we don't want you, right? And so there was, there was just this feud. There, there, really, this feud was, was um, Jesus knew that feud because remember when he talked about the, the, the Samaritan, the good Samaritan? When someone was on the side of the road, he talked about the good Samaritan, and, and, and you know, to use that as the good person to the Jews was like, you know, how, why would anybody want to be a Samaritan, right? That, that's how deep it was. And, and one, one of the things that has to happen, many of the Jews would literally travel days to go around Samaria if they were going to make their way up to the northern region or from the northern region down to, the, down to, to Jerusalem just so they didn't have to go through Samaria, that, that's how much they despised them. And so here we have Jesus sending a team ahead of him. Now, now there, was, there was, you know, the 12 following him along with, it appears, many other disciples that were following Jesus. And they were making preparations for the night so that they can stay. They're making preparations for dinner, for food. And so they send this, this entourage ahead of them to make preparations. And as they come into the, tan, the town, they they discovered that it's Jesus and his disciples that are coming into the town. And they say, you know what? We don't want nothing to do with you guys. You're not welcome here. We don't, we don't want you camping here. We don't want, we don't want you eating here. We, we, want, we want nothing. There was no hospitality toward them whatsoever. Now, it appears that they were threatened by Jesus and his disciples and, and, and because of it, you know, once again, the retaliation, you know, with this, just, you, you guys just do your own thing. We really don't care what you do, but you just don't do it here. That, that, was, that was their attitude. Probably because of the religious, religious leaders of the Samaritans had a problem with Jesus because of the conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well, she was a, who was a Samaritan. Remember, remember the woman at the well? When Jesus is conversing with her and, and you know, he, he just kind of, you know, asked for a drink of water, and, and she goes, you, you know, she's kind of confounded by that because a man never talked to a woman, and so Jesus is, and, and she, you know, she's um, saying, you know, having this conversation, and Jesus, Jesus turns to this woman, and he says, look, um, why, 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 don't, why don't you go get your husband? And she goes, well, I don't have a husband. He goes, yeah, you tell me the truth because you've had five. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> Not only, not only have you had five husbands, but the guy that you're shacking up right now, he's not your husband. I mean, you want to talk about conviction, right? This, this woman just standing back going, whoa. 
And then she says, you know what, you want water? I, because I, you, you're, you, all you have is regular water. I have the living water. And once I give you the living water, you, you'll, you'll never thirst again. And it was at that point that she wanted to change the subject to religion. She goes, hey, you Jews worship in Jerusalem, but we worship here. And, and Jesus takes that, that, you know, that whole uh, conversation. He says, look, salvation comes of the Jews. In other words, he, he was validating that the, what the Jews were doing, worshiping Jerusalem, was the right thing to do. And, and I imagine the word got back and throughout the community, because that woman gets saved and all of her friends and people were coming around. They get saved, you know, and, and now there was this, this conflict that he had started in the, the region of Samaria. And so now Jesus is coming through with his group and they go, look, we don't want you here. And, and James and John, James and John, the, th- the sons of thunder, they had a great reputation. James and John, they were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they had met with Elijah and Moses and Jesus and in his glorified body. And I imagine James and John are just like, man, we're, we're going we're gonna, to, you know, we, we, we hung out with Elijah. And we're, we're going we're gonna to emulate his ministry. You see, Elijah uh, was, was a guy who, you know, really, um, he took care of business. There, there, was, there was an entourage. The king heard that Elijah was, was kind of, you know, telling the secrets of the king and see, you know, what, what the king would say in secret, Elijah knew because God would reveal it to him. And so he was going to send and have Elijah arrested and he, sung, he sent 50 soldiers to come and arrest him. And as he sent those 50 soldiers, Elijah said, hey, if I'm a man of God, uh, let fire come down from heaven and burn you guys up. And then pff, they were smoked. And then it happened again. They got another 50, right, and, and smoked them again. And, and John, and, or uh, the, the, the two here, James and John, are just going, Lord, you, do you want us to call fire down from heaven? We, <laughs> we can take care of it. I mean, think about how effective that would be for evangelism. Once you've smoked one city, you're never going to have problems with another city. Just use these guys as an example, and we'll just go tell them, hey, saw, you saw what happened to them. Don't make us. We'll call down fire, buddy. And, and I imagine that they were offended, you know, the James and John, thinking, you know, how dare them reject the, the Messiah, the Savior? How dare them, you know, kind of not even be attentive to the needs of Jesus? You know what? Th- these guys deserve to burn. And that, that was their attitude. That was their heart. It was, it was you know what, Lord, did you just say the word. You just say the word. We'll, we'll call fire. And check this out. It says, Jesus rebuked them. I, you know, being rebuked by Jesus, I mean, that's probably not one of your... Things like on your agenda, in your bucket list or something, right? Someday I want to be rebuked by Jesus. I mean, I mean, the, Jesus just says, what are you guys thinking? I, 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 lo- I love how he responds. You, you don't even know what manner of spirit you're of. You guys don't even know what you're saying. You see, there was a different dispensation that they were coming in. It, it was, it's not about God's wrath. It's about God's grace. And Jesus was full of grace and truth. He, he was the, the epitome of grace. And his grace was now extending to everybody, anybody. Not just the Jew, not just the Samaritan. It, it, was, it was to the Gentiles. You see, the grace of God is now being introduced to the world. You see, the, the, in this dispensation, there's only one person who wants to kill and steal and destroy. That's the devil. And the devil is still, to this very day, guys, attempting to kill, to steal, and to destroy. We 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 seen evil this past week in, in Las Vegas, didn't we? Just just someone who just just for the sake of killing, just for the sake of, of destroying lives, they just go in and, and start to shoot bullets into crowds. That's evil. And it's very in line with the spirit of the evil one. 
And Jesus, with his own disciples, are going, what, 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 you, guys, you guys don't even know what spirit you're of right now. That's nothing to do with why I came. It has nothing to do with who God is. Matter of fact, he, he simply tells them like this. He says, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. As Jesus came to save lives, that's why he came. And for these last 2,000 years, that's been the message. God wants to save lives. Matter of fact, Peter would go on to say in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. Now, what was happening in 2 Peter is everyone was saying, well, how come the Lord hasn't come back yet? How come the Lord hasn't come back yet? Maybe the Lord's, you know, not going to come back. Maybe he, he just can't come back. Maybe we don't have the power to come back. And, and, and here's what Peter says, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise. As some count slackness, but he's long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You see, God's heart is that everyone would come to repentance. The reason he hasn't come back yet is because he's waiting for that last person to finally surrender his life to Jesus Christ. His wrath is coming, it is coming, it, it just, it's just a matter of when. But, but if, in this dispensation that you and I are in, it's this opportunity that God's grace has been extended to everyone. And, and I think sometimes in our, in our uh, you know, zeal, in our, in our excitement, we think, Lord, just, just bring fire. And that's not the heart of God. You see, the heart of God is that man would be saved. I, I heard a statistic not too long ago that it'll take someone on average seven times to hear the gospel before they respond to the gospel. Seven times. Can you imagine? Someone hears the gospel, you know, once, twice, three times, they rejected it, four times, five times, and then, you know, six times, and then the seventh time they responded. And then somewhere along the line when someone is mocking or laughing or, 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 or rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and then here comes one of his followers and say, Lord, just smoke them now. Right? Not the heart of God. You, 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 you can't force someone into the kingdom and, and you can't force someone to repent. You know, you, you, I think this, this is really a, a statement against, you know, the, the crusades that, that went in and tried to, you know, uh, wipe out anyone who rejected Christ or, 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 or the Inquisition or, you know, all of these things throughout history that has tried to somehow uh, force Christianity upon the heart of people or else die, right? I, I think here, th 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 this isn't like, like Islam, Jesus is saying, look, this, this is not how my kingdom is going to operate. It's not going to be forced upon you, but you're also not going to retaliate against someone who's rejected me. It, it, it's just not um, how the kingdom of heaven is going to work. Because it's not the heart of God. Because God is long-suffering and patient, and he's willing that none would perish. And that's, that's exactly the lesson. And I think it's a lesson that all of us need to hear, man. You know what, man? We're not called to, um, you know, to hate people that reject Jesus. We're not called to, to defend Jesus somehow that, you know, it's our responsibility. If they don't accept Jesus, we'll get them in an arm bar and, you know, make them tap out. That, that's, that's, not, that's not the heart of Jesus, man. The heart of Jesus is that, you know what, the gospel, as it's going forth, it's able to cut hearts. It's able to change lives. And then that person has to, from his own will and from his own heart, acknowledge, man, I'm a sinner and I need to repent of my sin. When, you, when someone repents of their sin, it just simply means that you're, you're making a, a different uh, direction. You're, you're changing course. I, I once used to be this, but I, that, that's not what I am anymore. I was heading for hell, but that's not where I'm going anymore. Now I'm turning around and now I am being changed, and I'm heading for heaven. That's repentance. And, and Jesus simply says is that in this, in this particular passage, he says, look, uh, I want to save them. I want to save them. All the Samaritans, I want to save them. I want them to come to know me. I want them to experience the forgiveness that God has provided for them as Jesus would make his way to the cross months from here and that he would die for the sins of the whole world. And so here, Jesus really puts a, uh, 
perspective in the hearts of the disciples. Remember, many of them are going to be persecuted. Many of them are going to die. With the exception of two will die a martyr's death. We know that uh, Judas will betray him. He, he ends up hanging himself. And we know that John, the beloved, is martyred. He's put into a vat of boiling oil, but it didn't burn him. And so they took John and they put him on the island of Patmos because they didn't know what to do with him. They couldn't kill him, so they decided, we'll just kind of ostracize him from everybody. And while he's on the, on the island of Patmos is when he had the revelation, the book of Revelation was given to him. And every, all the rest of the disciples would die a martyr's death. And they needed to learn this lesson right away. Look, you're, 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 this isn't going to be um, you know, war. This isn't going to be retaliation. This isn't going to be you calling down fire from heaven to, do, to consume people. I didn't come to consume. I, I came to save them. I came to save them. And it's still the heart, the heart of God to this day. God wants to save the lost. He, 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 doesn't, he doesn't have camps. He doesn't go, well, I'll save you, but I won't save you. He, he, you see, the Bible says, whoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever will, will acknowledge they need a savior, confess their sins, that person will be saved. And so it was the heart of Jesus. Now as we move into the next passage here, verse 57, you know, I, I think he's teaching the disciples some very important lessons, and then he's going to continue that here in verse 57 with some of the other disciples that are following him. We're going to read verse 57, then we're going to go all the way to verse 62, and then we'll come back and we'll expound upon those. Watch what he says. And it happened as they journeyed on the road. Now, you're going to find that throughout the gospel of Luke now, their journey. They're, they're, not, they're not, you know, in uh, Galilee, they, they don't, they're not at Peter's house. They're going to be all the way until they get to Bethany where Mary and Martha and Lazarus are. They're going to be on this journey going to Jerusalem. And, and we'll see that uh, brought to us on, on multiple occasions as, as we're reading through the rest of Luke all the way to chapter 20. And, and what, what's incredible is that they're now you know on this journey and then it tells us that one of the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And Jesus said to another, follow me. And he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Another also said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them for farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. Wow. I remember as a, as a new Christian, as a baby Christian, I remember reading this passage, and, and it, I, I was like, man, that's harsh. I mean, Jesus, you know, you can't even go say goodbye. You, you know, your, you, your, your parents die. You can't even go bury them. What's Jesus saying here? And, and as you read the passage, I, I think there's so much more to it when you begin to study this passage. One of the things that you find at the very beginning is, is that this first guy who said, Lord, I'm willing to follow you wherever you go. What we find out according to Matthew's account of this is that the guy was a scribe who said that. It was a scribe. See, a scribe is one who was, who was copying the scriptures. And, and because he had spent much of his life copying the scriptures, he had become very familiar with the scriptures. And oftentimes the scribes would become teachers and, and they would have, you know, a, a great uh, um, audience. They would, they would have a lot of people who would he hear them because they had become so proficient in the law. They had become so f proficient in, in the scriptures. And so this scribe, and, and, you know, I think it's real easy to look down upon this guy and go, oh, you know, you know Jesus is rebuking him. I don't, I don't think that's the case here. I, I think this gentleman really, th think about what it would take for a scribe to come and say, Lord, Master, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. 
That, that, that would have meant that he was disagreeing with the other religious leaders that were already out to get Jesus. That it, it, it was already out there that if you're going to follow Jesus and you can't, you're not welcome in the temple, you're, you can't be part of the leadership of Jerusalem. I mean, you know, you, you were making a decision ostracizing yourself from your, your peers and, and, and you know, your, your fellow servants that, of Judaism. And, and this guy says, you know what, I, I don't care about you know, be, being a scribe. I don't care about my, my stature and culture. You know what, Lord, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. When you use that word Lord, that, that, that means it's the word kuros, and, and, and it's the idea is, is that he's the one who calls the shots in your life. He's the one who you surrender your life to. And so you're going to call him Lord. What you're saying is, is that you're the Lord of my life. You're the master of my life. You, I don't call the shots anymore. You call the shots. You're, you're the one who guides me. You're the one who directs me. You're, you're, you're the one who I follow. And, and, and this guy just comes to, to, to the Lord, and he says, look, I, I, I'm going to follow you wherever, wherever it is you go. And I think Jesus is put, putting a check here. He's checking him. Do you, do you really mean that? Is this just an emotional uh, you know, statement that you're making? Is this some emotional decision you're making? Or, or, or do, you, do you really mean that you're willing to follow me wherever I go? One of the things you'll, you'll notice as we're going through this, we don't, we don't know the response of any of these guys. We don't know how they took what Jesus told them. We don't know what, the, what their... Um, uh, decision was after Jesus telling them these things, and I don't think it was meant for us to know because because here's the deal, guys. It wasn't meant for us to know what happened to them. I think the question comes is what what are you and I going to do with what is being said here? Because God's talking to you, to me. I, I don't believe anything written in Scripture is there by coincidence or chance. I, I believe it was there for our learning and for our. admonishment. I mean, the, the scripture is given so that you and I would have to check our own hearts. And, and Jesus responds to this guy who says, Lord, I, I, I'll go anywhere. He says, do, do, do you realize what you're saying? Do, do you really acknowledge what you're saying? Watch what he says. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you still want to follow me? Because you're going to follow me. That means the same for you. The foxes have holes. They got, they got a place to, to rest their head at night. The, the birds of the air have a nest to rest their head, but I don't even have that. And, and, I, and I think there's, there's just this whole idea that Jesus is, is, is wanting to bring across to them. Look, are you willing to follow me, even if it's going to cost you the worldly comforts, the amenities that you have right now? Are you willing to follow him no matter, no matter what it's going to cost you? I, I think that, that's a question that we all have to ask. It's a question we all have to you know, come and face to face with. Am I willing to follow Jesus even if it's going to cost me all of my comforts of life? Wow. You see, that's a question that I ask Periodically, me and my wife talk about that question. You know, could, because when we moved to, to Millennium, Mexico, you see, we, we we left everything. I left my job. I left. I left. You know, all my possessions. You know, brought very little with us. Uh, on a, all I can fit on a little S10 truck, and it was up. You know, up my whole life piled up, and we were coming across the country. And 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 then I asked Marguerite, you know, what what if God were to tell us to go somewhere right now? Are we willing to do it? If the Lord were to tell me, you know, it's time to go to the mission field, or I, I have a different place for you. Now, God hasn't spoken to me or told me anything, but, but I, I, will, I always want to make sure that if, if God were to tell me that I'll be ready to go, wherever that is, whatever that looks like, even if it means, I, you know, I, I have to give away my pillow and my mattress. You see, it was easy 25 years ago because my pillow wasn't very good. <laughs> Neither was my mattress, to be quite honest. I have a pretty nice pillow now. And the comforts of, 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 you know, having been, you know, established for 25 years. And, you know, you, you just kind of like, wait a second. If God were to tell you just to take everything right now and, and go, what, would you be willing to do it? And, and it's a check. 
It's a check in my own heart. God, I, I don't ever want to be in a place where I'm not willing to give up everything for you. I don't ever want to be in a place where I'm so comfortable that I'm not willing to follow you. And G- Jesus just calls this guy. He says, look, um, I, I want you to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of mine, to follow me. I, I want you to take into consideration. I don't want you to take this lightly. I don't want you to take this nonchalantly. You, do you really want to follow me? Because I don't know where I'm going to sleep tonight. I, I don't know where, where I'm going to lay down my head tonight. But if you want to follow me, um, you're, you're also going to um, have that as your life as well. As what, what Jesus isn't saying that you can't have a house or nice things or you, you can't have a bank account. That, that, that's, that's not what he's saying. He say, what he's saying is, is do these things take a higher priority in your life than I take in your life? What's higher? Is your comforts, your amenities? If the Lord were to tell you to go to the mission field for a month, you know, every time, you know, going to, to the mission field, Peru, I mean, it, it goes through my mind. We're going to be, it's going to be miserable in the jungles. No air conditioning. It, 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 I, I'm convinced when, we get to, when, when you get to Pocalpa, I'm convinced it's, it's just a, a taste of what the tribulation is going to be like. The air doesn't blow. It just stands still. And it, it doesn't take me like two minutes and I'm soaking wet. I'm standing there and all the, all the natives are looking at you like, what's wrong with you? It's human here. No, it's not. <laughs> You're like, yes, it is. This is miserable. I get in the shower, you, you take a shower, and you can't even dry off. Because the time you finally dry off, you're wet again. It's like, let me just stay here in a towel all day. Just and, and, and every time you're gonna go, we're going to go off to another mission trip or go off to just someplace, you just think, all right, man, th- th- this, 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 is, this is not going to be comfortable. A hotel there isn't like a hotel here, trust me. It's like sleeping on a, on a log oftentimes. And, you know, it, but you just realize, you know what, Lord, whatever you want, man, I, I, want, I want to serve you. And, and, and if that were to be, you know, the, the rest of my life, then so be it. I, I, I want to have that heart. But I always got to check my heart. I always got to come back and say, all right, God, am I willing to give you everything? When it comes to my comforts, when it comes to my, 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 um, my the things that, that I want, rather than the things that you want. And I think Jesus is just simply telling this guy, look, following me quite possibly can cost you something. Are you still willing to do it? Are you still willing to do it? No, notice the second one that comes. And this is the one that I, I thought was, like, it really took me back. Verse 59, when he says, and he said to another, follow me. Now Jesus is pursuing this guy. And, and, and this guy says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and preach the kingdom of God. And, and you know, I remember reading that going, man, that's harsh. I mean, this guy's dad died and, you know, Jesus don't even want him to go bury him. What's up with that? Because that's not what's happening. You, you, you need to understand the Jewish culture. If someone died... They bury him the same day. So if, if, this, if this man's father had died, he would have never been with Jesus that day. He would have been burying his dad that day. What he's really saying is, Lord, as soon as my dad dies, if that's five years from now or 10 years from now or 20 years from now, then I'll follow you. Now, When a father died, there, there was, a, a lot happened. You see, when, when a father died, then, then you get your inheritance. Now, now, now you're set. You got the bank account kind of cushioned. You know, you could, now, now you, you know, hey, once I get my inheritance, Lord, then I'm ready to go. Let, let, let's bring that to our terms. Right? You know, once I retire, once I got my Social Security check coming every week, then, Lord, I'm in. I want to make sure that I got all of my ducks in a row. And once I got all my ducks in a row, then, I mean, you know what? I'm willing to follow you. Now, by the time that happens, most of us don't have enough energy to follow him. <laughs> We've given the best years of our life to, you know, serving this world and, you know, just setting up ourselves. And then we get there, you know, how many people retire and then like a week later they die? 
And, and, and Jesus here very, very clearly says, look, let the dead bury the dead. What's he saying? Let the dead bury the dead. Let, let, let the spiritually dead, but, you know, bury the physically dead. That, that's really what, what, he's, what he's saying. You know, now those who are spiritually dead, they, they know how to bury people. It's not that, it's not that hard. <laughs> but do, do you know what someone who's spiritually dead can't do? They can't preach the kingdom. They can't preach the gospel. If they're spiritually dead, they, they're not even qualified to do the things that Jesus is asking his followers to do. And so Jesus is very, very, very clear here, very, very, very pointed here. He, he just really wanted him to understand, look, um, it, you know, m- serving him is, isn't about, uh, you know, first let, let me do everything else I need to do, and then, you know, once I, once I, I get everything I need to get done, and then, Lord, then, then for sure, then I'll, I'll begin to, to, to follow you. Because you know what it really comes down to? It's just another excuse. If, if you, when, when it's all said and done, it's just another excuse why you can't follow him. I don't even think he's talking about following him as, as far as like going to plant a church or going to become a, a, a pastor. Or I, I don't think that, that that's even what he's talking. He's, he's talking about you know if you're gonna you know begin to live your life for the kingdom of heaven, you don't you don't you don't you can do that right now. You can do that in your workplace. You, you can do that, you know, in your family. You can do that wherever you find yourself. This, is, this isn't about, well, once I get to this point in my life, then I'll really begin to dedicate my life to the Lord. Then I'll be able to serve the Lord. And then, no, it's just another excuse because here's what happens once you finally set your goal. And then what will happen is that, you know, that goal won't be good enough. Now, when, when, once I get to this goal, then I'll do it. It, after I saved a million dollars for retirement, you know, then I'll start to serve the Lord. You save the million. Well, you know, I need two million. Then once, you know, you, you know inflation, it's gotten bad. Now, now I need two million. And there will always be another excuse why we can't follow him with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul, and all of our strength. There's always that one more thing. And, and Jesus says, look, stop making excuses, man. Don't tell me five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, then you'll come and follow me. Follow me now. Go start to preach the kingdom now. Start to live your life for the things that are eternal now, not, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, not five years, 10 years from now. Start to do it now. You follow me. It's interesting that Jesus is laying out for his disciples that following him is going to cost something. It's going to cost something. No, no, notice this last guy. Look at verse 61. He says, another also said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. And Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And, and, you know, that request seemed like a very innocent request. You know, let me go tell everybody bye. And you go, nope, you can't tell nobody bye. Again, not, not what's happening in the text. You see, when, when, when someone is saying, I want to go bid farewell to my family, what, what's really being said here is I, I need to go get their approval and their blessing if I'm going to follow you. I, I need to make sure that everybody is in agreement, that my mom and dad say it's okay, that my, you know, my, my, uh, my, my brothers and sisters you know, agree that that's okay. And then one, once I got their approval, once they tell me farewell, you know, we're, we're, we're behind you, we bless you, go for it. Then I'll come and follow you. And, and I, I, you, you look at this, this whole picture here, is that it was dependent upon what others thought, even your own family. If you're going to wait for, for your family to, to bless you serving the Lord, man, you, you're, you're never going to do it. Because you're, you're, you're waiting for someone else to give the approval for you to do what God's telling you to do. You see, I, I, I can only tell my experience. I, I, you know, I, I don't know your story. I can tell you my story. I, I remember um, you know, the, the Lord calling me to Berlin 
20, 26, 27 years ago and praying about moving to Berlin. We, it's been almost, uh, you know, 24 years, going on 25 years that, we, that me and my wife moved out here. And I had been praying for a long time. I remember, I remember you know, just, you know, thinking, man, if I'm going to go, we're, go, we're going to Berlin. I mean, my dad, I remember going to my dad and saying, Dad, I think God's calling me to go to Berlin. And my dad told me, you know, don't go. And, and because, you know, my, my dad left this area uh, when, when he was, uh, had a family, when I was born, uh, I was only four months old. My dad left Berlin because he couldn't find work here. And he said, man, you're going to move over there. You, you got a little, you got a daughter that, that's, you know, a few months old. And it's interesting. I, my daughter was this, almost the same age that I was when my parents left. Now, I, the same age, we're coming back. And my dad's going, well, why are you going to go down there? How are you going to feed your family? How are you going to take care of your little girl? And, and I, you know, I, I, had to, I had to really wrestle with that. I went back and like, Lord, are you sure you want me to go? I mean, you know, my, my, own, my own father is discouraging me from doing that. I remember reading this passage just saying, look, who are you going to listen to? To me? Or to your, to your, to your dad? That, that was hard. That, that, that was one of those times in my life where I, I had to go, okay, Lord, I, I, I'm going to follow you no matter what. Be, and and I, I can't tell you how many people won't make a decision for Jesus Christ because they don't want to offend their mom or their dad. They don't, their religion that, that they used to belong to, that mom and dad belong to, if you leave that religion, then uh, you know, you, you've, you've shamed the family. And because of it, man, we, just, we won't even move. We won't even leave. We won't even, I even had people come and say, look, we, we go to a first service here and we go to a second service at another church because I don't want mom and dad to get mad or the family to get mad. And, and, and I think G- Jesus here is very, very, very clear. He says, look, man, you, you, you don't need the approval of man, man. You need the approval of God. You don't need what God says. That's what a disciple does. A disciple is willing to put everything on the line, the comforts of life, the financial security of life, and even the family approval. You're willing to come and say, look, I, I, I am more concerned about following Jesus than I am any of these other things that are gonna be put at me. More so than my own comforts. More so than my own financial security. And more so than what other people want me to do. Guys, following Jesus isn't the, the, the easy thing to do. It's the hard thing to do. It's, it's the narrow road. It's the hard road. Following Jesus means that you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to have people that, that, that come against you. Some of, the, some of the things that, you know, the comforts that you would have had had you not, you know, are, are, are never going gonna to happen because you've, you've chosen a different path in life. It's interesting, and I want to ask you to turn here real quick. John, John, chapter, John chapter 6. An interesting passage in the Gospel of John. You see, Jesus was with his disciples, and Jesus started to say some things that were very uh, hard for some, many of his disciples to, to understand. They, 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 they didn't, they didn't um, know how to, how to take it. Matter of fact, they were offended by it, and um, Jesus is going to have to... Uh, part ways with some of his disciples. Here's where we're going to pick it up in verse 66. And if you want to read the whole chapter, man, incredible chapter, Jesus says, my flesh is blood, is, is food, and my blood is drink indeed. And, and you know, they were just, they, they didn't know how to process that. You have to eat my flesh, you have to drink my blood. And, and, and they, they, they thought, man, this is cannibalism. You know what Jesus is talking about? And Jesus was talking spirit, right? He was talking spiritual stuff that he was going to give his life and he was going to offshed his blood for them. And, and they, they just could not comprehend it. And then in verse 66, it says this, and from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. A lot of them said, you know what? We, we, we started this journey, but we don't, we don't want to continue on this journey. The things you're saying they don't agree with, you know, my comfort. It doesn't agree with, 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 my, with my security. It doesn't agree with, you know, the approval that I'm looking for from others. And so this says that they, they turned away from following Jesus. And then Jesus turns to the 12. And watch what he says there in verse 67. And Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? You, you guys leaving too? And Peter Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
you have the words of eternal life. Also, we've come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I love, I love Peter. He says, Lord, wh- where am I going to go? I, I've already tasted truth. I already know who you are. I already know what you've done in my life. Where else am I going to find satisfaction? Where else am I going to find peace? Where else am I going to find eternal life? You're it. You're it. And so, it, it, no matter what that means, I, I'm, I'm staying with you. If it means that I, that I lose everything here, if it means that everyone turns on me and hates me here, then so be it. If it means I've got to sleep on rocks, so be it. Because I don't follow Jesus for what I get from him. I follow Jesus for what he's already given me. And he's given me eternal life. And he's washed my sins. He owes me nothing else. And Peter understood that. And Jesus is, is going to continue to bring his disciples to this place where, where you, you, you understand, look, I'm not following Jesus because it, this, is, this is, you know, I'm going to get more stuff out of it. You know, I think much of the church has this wrong idea of what it means to follow Jesus. You, 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 read, you listen to some of the TV evangelists and you think that following Jesus means that you're going to have, uh, you know, more... Um, toys and more possessions and you're going you're gonna to have a bigger bank account and you're not going to have any problems and you're always going to be healthy and wealthy and everything's going to be dandy. That, that, that's, that's not the gospel. I follow Jesus. If, if, if everything was taken from me, I follow him not because of what he gave me. I follow him because of what he's done for me. And Jesus is letting his disciples understand, look guys, all of these other things, all of these other things will just be a distraction. Again, there's nothing wrong with the things unless those things become our God. There's nothing wrong with the things. Having, I hope you have a nice mattress, a nice pillow. I, I hope you have a bank account and you're preparing for retirement someday. And I, I, I mean, I, I, there's nothing wrong with those. As long as those things don't take a higher priority than following him. Jesus, and, 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 and it'll be a few months before we get there, but uh, let me, let, let's wrap it up with, with Luke chapter 14. We'll, we'll, we'll be here again, but, but I, I just think that this really kind of helps kind of put it all in perspective. Look at verse 25 of Luke chapter 14. Look at verse 25. A great multitude went with Jesus. He turned to them and he said to them, now think about, you know, he's amassing crowds. More and more people are following him. There are more and more disciples that, that, are, that are, you know, journeying along this path with him. And then Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now when Jesus says, if anyone doesn't hate everybody else, he's not telling us to hate anybody. Remember, he's love. Again, I, I think that, that understanding what, what he's trying to say, he's saying, if, if your love for me isn't greater and in comparison, hatred for everyone else, then you can't be my disciple. That, that's, that's heavy. That's heavy. Because what he is saying is that, look, your love for me should supersede your love for everything else and everybody else, including your own life. And, and then look what he says in verse 27, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and come and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he's laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Wow. You see, Jesus used a parable here, a lesson. He says, hey, before you begin this journey, man, count the cost. Count the cost. 
what it means to be a disciple, man. This isn't just a matter of, of you know, this is a convenient thing or, or this is just a cool thing or this is just a hip thing to do. That man, I'm going to follow Jesus because I understand who he is and I understand the authority he has over my life. Count the cost. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Remember, remember going back to, to chapter 9, the very last verse there in the chapter, verse 62? He says, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No one begins the work. If you got the plow in your hand and you're already plowing, that means you've already, you've already signed up to do the work. I'm already, I'm already doing, I'm, I'm, I'm plowing the ground. But then in the middle of your plowing, you kind of look back and you go, hmm, did I really count the cost? And you're ready to throw in the towel. Guys, he, I think the, the whole picture here is this. When someone would be plowing the ground, it wasn't with, 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 with a hoe. They, they would be plowing the, the ground as they had an ox in front of them, and you would have the plow dug into the ground, and, you're, and, you're, and you have to steer that plow in order to keep your furrow straight and in order to keep the line straight. But if you're there, you know, plowing, and you, and you kind of got your, your, your plow on the ground, but then you're looking backwards, what are you going to do? You're, you're going to end up with a crooked, with a crooked, a crooked row. And, and God isn't looking for us to have a crooked row when it comes to following him. He wants us to be straight. He wants us to be on the level. He wants us to be just, just you know what, man? I, I know what I signed up for. I know who I am in Jesus Christ. And I know where my hope is. And I know what I'm doing, man. I'm going to follow him no matter what. That's what a disciple of Jesus does. My prayer that, that, that we're not just gathering together a group of people. This isn't the Moose Lodge. This isn't just, just a, a good place for us to hang out together. That we're disciples of Jesus. We're following him. And this isn't about you know, our will, my will, your will. This is about, God, how do we get in line with your will so that we can build your kingdom and that the gospel can go forth with clarity into the community that God has placed us in. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for this time. We thank you for the privilege, God, that we've been given, Lord, just, just to hear truth. And Lord, I pray that that truth would ring true in every one of our hearts. That, God, we, we would, we would under, understand the implications, Lord, of what it means to be a disciple. We would understand that, God, we're, we're, this isn't about us anymore. This is about you in us. And, Lord, may, may that truth, God, just ring true. Lord, I pray maybe this morning there's some of us here that, that have never made a decision to be followers of yours. We've never confessed that we're sinners and we need a Savior. And, Lord, I pray this morning would be the day, God, where you would grip that heart and that you would change that life, and there would be repentance, and you would save anyone here that's not saved from their sin. And so, Father, I pray this morning, Lord, if that's true of one of us or many of us here today, that right now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, we would come to that place of repentance in our own life and confess that we need a Savior. And just really quick, man, this morning, if you're here and God is speaking to you, You've never asked Jesus to come into your heart. You never said, God, I, I, I need to change my life. I need to be forgiven for my sins. And I realize that it cost you your life to accomplish that. And I want to ask you to come in and change me. If that's you this morning and God is speaking to your heart, would you just stand up right where you're at? Just stand up and say, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks or anybody says. I want to follow Jesus, man. I want to make him my Lord. And my Savior. If there's anybody at all, I just don't, I don't want to leave here without giving them that opportunity. If there's anyone, and you know who you are, man, and you realize I need to get right with God this morning, would you just stand up? Just right where you're at, man. Just acknowledge, man, I need to get right with Jesus. Anybody at all? No? All right. God bless you. God bless you. 
Anybody else, man? We're going to pray right now. God bless you. That's awesome. If there's anybody else, man, we want to pray with those that want to make that decision this morning. And I, I, don't, I don't want you to leave here without having that opportunity, man. So if there's anybody else, those that are standing, God bless you, brother. Awesome. Awesome. Anybody else, man? If you're standing, would you please stay standing? We're going to pray right now. I'm going to ask you from your heart to God. I'm going to ask you to say these words as we, bef before the Lord, we, we acknowledge our need. Awesome. Well, let's pray. Those of you that are standing, would you, from your heart to God, would you pray this prayer with me? Just right here, right now. Let's just pray this prayer. Dear God, I confess that I'm a sinner. And I thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. God, would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? And would you fill me with your Holy Spirit right now? And would you be my Lord from this day forward? And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.